In 2018, five people lost their lives as a result of motorcycle accidents in St. Lucia. By 2020, that figure had almost doubled, with no signs of slowing down. In an effort to understand why so many young men fall victim to this two-wheel mayhem, I interviewed a cadre of motorcyclists from the various riding clubs in St. Lucia. The instructors who certify these riders finally spoke, and the police who are charged with taming the carnage speak of the ultimate ban. A crippled biker recounts a reckless ride on ball tires which led to his broken spine. This documentary also delves into the creation of a biker, from childhood stunts to the eulogy of fellow bikers. We don't only report on the indiscipline, but also the brotherhood, the leathers, the freedom of the open road, and the philanthropy which all encompass bike life in St. Lucia. This is an all too familiar sight. The puffy eyes, the long black dresses, the train of noisy two-wheelers on a procession to the unfortunate church. The line of fellow lodge members who come to pay their respects. The long speeches and the eulogy. The memory of another fallen soldier. And over the years, there have been many. Fall after fall, a monotony of reefs, regrets, and absolutely no change in behavior until the next two-wheeler falls. This is the story of bike life in St. Lucia. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> Top shot eyes back. Gangsta. Real life. So I keep making it. Ready. So the finger won't make it. Empty the Glock 17 in my chest. Yeah, that's a goal of that. You know, see the pity them off. So me give them everything in the... The first internal combustion petrol-fueled motorcycle was the Daimler Wright Wagon. It was designed and built by the German inventors Gottlieb Daimler and Wilhelm Maybach in 1885. This vehicle was unlike either the safety bicycles or the bone shaker bicycles of that era in that it had zero degrees of steering axis angle and no fork offset and thus did not use the principles of bicycle or motorcycle dynamics developed nearly 70 years earlier. Instead, it relied on two outrigger wheels to remain upright while turning. By 1898, Triumph Motorcycles in England commenced production and by 1903, it was producing over 500 bikes. Indian began production in 1901 and Harley-Davidson was established two years later. By the outbreak of World War I, Indian was the largest motorcycle manufacturer in the world, producing over 20,000 bikes per year. By 1920, Harley-Davidson was the largest manufacturer and their motorcycles were being sold by dealerships in 67 countries. In the 1950s, Streamlining began to play an increasing part in the development of racing motorcycles and the dustbin fairing held out the possibility of radical changes to motorcycle design. NSU and Motor Guzzi were in the vanguard of this development, both producing very radical designs well ahead of their times. NSU produced the most advanced designs but after the deaths of four NSU riders in the 1954 to 1956 season, they abandoned development and quit Grand Prix motorcycle racing. 
The metamorphosis from bicycles into motorcycling is a natural evolutionary process for many a two-wheel thrill seeker. It started from the time I was riding my, my bicycle around. Really got me interested in the whole riding thing. Enjoyed it. Took all my falls on it. And it seemed almost a natural progression. I don't remember ever being introduced to any gear riding bicycles. So your parents bought your whole bike and bought you no gear? Oh, no gear at all. No gear. And I think part of that is because they never knew what we were up to on the bicycles. You see, when it's Christmas time, move the times, parents just go and just buy bicycles for the children. They never buy protective gears, especially helmet. So the children now start learning to do their stuff without helmet and them kind of whistle. Then now they graduate from bicycle into scooter, same system. You understand? Just riding the road, no protective gears again, like I say. And then they will live from a scooter into big bikes. And then them same fellas, same attitude, no helmet on the head, so. Take it light, take it light. Right. Evolution from bicycles to motorcycles, just the thrill of the speed, um, the excitement, freedom of, of doing what you want when you want. Back then there was nothing called protective gear. It was survival of the fittest. Um, stunts, anything you can think of, anything dangerous, anything scary. Moving from your bicycle to a motorcycle, what was the transition like? Did you get a permit before you got a bike? Permit? Never heard of it back then. Um, no, all I needed at the time was my mom's permission to park the motorcycle at her house <laughs> because I lived there. The first bike I had, or well, the scooter, I, I never even insured, insured that. I never thought about insuring that or nothing like that. To me, that was just like a bicycle. Then I got the first motorcycle. I don't think I tried to look for insurance on that bike until Officer Leo had stopped me. <laughs> he stopped me and you already know. Next day I had to get it insured. But somebody, I had to put it on somebody's name because I didn't have the permit or whatever. How many years did you ride without a, a license? All my bike life. <laughs> Well, I was riding my father's bike, I never had a license. I rode countless bikes, I never had a license. Um, I got my license at 36. Had you ever been stopped by the cops? Plenty of times. And what um, Oops, I forgot my wallet. Oh, I don't have my, my, my license on me now. I'll come to you tomorrow. Tell me where to meet you. I'm definitely gonna be there at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I'm a no-show. My time for riding was usually on a weekend or late afternoons, when I figured the police would have gone to sleep by then, you know? Because you know we have a custom in St. Lucia where after six o'clock, chances are you won't get the police on the road. So I'll take my chances then, you know? Um, even at one point, my bike didn't even have a number plate. I'll be honest with you because I got a ticket for just slapping on a number plate on my bike, which I think at the time was $1,500 for, for the ticket. And according to them, the charge, I think it stated, um, having a, it, something to do with having a fraudulent plate. But then when I went through the list of charges, not displaying a number plate, the charge was $500. So I took off the plate instead and I rode without a plate. That to me was an easier charge to bed than $1,500. The road transport system in St. Lucia is flawed. For $75, this agency hands you a motorcycle permit without a theory or practical exam. In fact, there is no prerequisite for obtaining a permit. Once purchased, you are then legal to ride one of these around for six months. 
when the permit expires, you're welcome to come again and have it renewed. Many motorcyclists exploit this loophole and remain on the road illegally for years. Over the years, the ministry has made significant strides to encourage outlaw bikers to become licensed. Dwight Daisy, undoubtedly one of the biggest petrol heads, moved from outlaw to instructor alongside St. Lucia's first female motorcycle riding instructor. When we return, a biker is buried, another biker is buried, and a crippled biker lives to tell the tale. Gerald calling you outside. It must be one of your work tools he wants to borrow. Last time was the mixer, the pressure washer, the jackhammer. Now what? Well, hello, Gerald. My husband isn't in right now. He's on the construction site. But he said, should you come over to give you this? William's equipment? What's that? They're located right next to Caribbean Metals in Union. They have every construction tool imaginable. You can buy or you can rent, from scaffolding to concrete vibrators, even vehicle batteries too. Don't forget, they're located right next to Caribbean Metals in Union. Williams Equipment Sales and Rentals. Telephone 450. Three two seven two. How many years did you ride before you got a rider's license? I have been on the road riding for pretty much six, seven years before I got my license. Did you have a challenge teaching riders who had done it for years unlicensed? Now they had to go through the training and the exam. What were some of the challenges dealing with these riders? Um, well, some of those challenges are that everybody believes they know it all. Um, I was at that point too, um, before I started my first basic training uh, in Texas. I thought I knew it all. I thought I knew the world of biking. I already had over 20 years plus years experience in riding. Um, I thought I knew, I've seen it all. I thought I knew it all until I sat down in a class with a lecturer who was twice my age with double my years of experience in riding. Um, he taught me that half of what I was doing was incorrect. A lot of people learn to ride from a friend, from a partner, mate will teach me. But he, he teaches you what he knows, which might have been the mistakes that he learned from, which would not be the correct way to learn. Guys will call. Your motorcycle instructor, yes. Ask for all the information. So I got all excited. He said, wait, you're female? I'm like, yeah. So is a female teaching me how to ride? Hell no. Brap. <laughs> The phone went down. And there I kept getting those same calls. A woman? Oh, phone went down. She said, that was my first student. It was a female. She says, I want to learn to ride. And so my journey began. There are men who would be very receptive to it. And uh, they would literally tell you, I came here because I figure it's a female and she'll be a little more patient with me. Others would tell me, you got to sign out, right? You just come in the game. <laughs> you can't tell me what to do. You know, I, I, mean, I mean, I just want to get a license. A lot of mistakes are made because people don't know how to stop, but they know how to go. A lot of people know how to ride before they know how to wear gear. A lot of people know what bike they want to buy before they decide to get the license. What was that like, having a girl teach you how to ride? 
Um, no way at all, to be honest with you. I didn't feel any way at all. I mean, I knew Stacy from before. Um, she with um, Dwight Daisy. So I look at Stacy pretty much as a fellow biker. It, it, it doesn't, I don't really see the gender difference. Going to the, the, the riding school and doing a couple of sessions before that day of the actual exam, I actually learned a lot. And I mean from stopping, considering the side of the road that we ride on, if I stop my bike, not to put my, obviously not having my right leg down for passing traffic and stuff like that, always have your right leg up and your left leg down. If you stop that side of the like little, these little things that you would um, disregard as a rider, you know, simple things that you would just, that would be just tossed out the window. You would never consider very valid points when you ride. Like these things alone made me realize you needed to be here a long time ago. Apart from the helmet, what are some of the other practices you see motorcyclists doing that you're not so pleased with? You must learn to at least stay in line. Not every time you see a vehicle in front of you, you're supposed to be at the front. Majority of the motorcyclist riders now, they don't want to stay behind. Anytime you see they're on the move, they always want to be in front. They overtake anywhere, at any time. You see? No duke and attention. It's just, they just have to be in front. A lot of riders believe that they are visible. You are not. Attention is the most cause of a motorcycle accident. Not watching what you're doing, where you're going. Vision, be able to see, hear. Same way, that's why like using your cell phone, even in a vehicle, using your cell phone is dangerous because you're not paying attention to the road. With motorists that are not checking their mirrors when moving off, um, when coming out from junctions, not looking for you know other motorists as well as motorcycles because they are small vehicles. Um, that'd be one. Two, I would say for motorcyclists not looking ahead, looking as far as the eyes can see, not just in front of the tire one or two vehicles ahead of you, but as far as you can see, looking into the junctions. Um, so that would be one. And the other one would be um, anticipating the actions of others. Another that we, um, we say is not complying with traffic rules and directions, like the red light is on, it's not for them. It appears that it's not for them. They do not stop where they need to stop and so on. They overtake on the wrong side. They, they do all sorts of things that's against the law. The main thing that I think a lot of riders do on the open road is assume. Um, instead of using the horn, they assume the rider, the driver has heard them. They assume the driver has seen them. Some riders make decisions without verifying their mirrors, without taking a lifesaver glance. Most riders who are not taught by an instructor do not even know what a lifesaver glance is. You know what we have noticed collectively is that when we are riding together, or when he gives me a story of when he was riding and some a driver did something, it's like, you serious? Or whilst we're on the bike together, we're both doing to drivers, like, what the hell are you doing? Don't you see us coming? But when we're driving and there are riders on the road, we're doing the same thing the driver, a driver would have done to us when we were riding. And it's like, you know, we, we're kind of selfish when we're riding and driving. If you understand what I'm saying? So as a rider, you think one way and as a driver, you think another way. I see guys pass on our bike and I'm saying, what the hell is he thinking? You know, like, boy, me just overtook four cars and literally just hit one gear down and flat around the corner. And I'm, to me, that's like ridiculous. You're a complete idiot to be doing that. And then when I jump on my bike, I'm doing the same thing. And the driver is probably thinking the same about you. And the driver's considering me to be that idiot at the time. That's what she's trying to say.
Gaza, let you go, Gaza. But I've never had a major fall. Yet. But that fall was major enough for me. Trust me, I don't want to have to deal with anything more than that. And what are you doing to prevent that? Wearing a full face helmet. Does that prevent you from falling? No. Okay. Oh, so why are the police giving you a ticket then? The I'm going to fall is, anyway. What are you doing to prevent a major fall? Only thing I can do is sell the bike. He's doing nothing to prevent a major fall. Some say falling is inevitable. It is. I thought it wasn't until I fell. That was like my first fall. So, to me, I know, I know guys who were riding for a long pool, but I was riding for... But he, he fell. He fell eventually. Okay. Yes, I remember 1986, the 19th of September. I was going up the highway. You know where the Freddy Garage is there? Comprehensive School. These days was just two lane. I was going up the road. It was like about actually going and, you know, going my little vibes. But after 11, close to midnight, and going around that corner, there was a guy who used to pick up the stuff from Halcyon. He's coming along with a little nine-seater. And they like remember whilst I going around the corner, he went, I don't know if in them days, sleep or what. And he was in the middle of the road because only one line. And then I collided, not, not collided like front, huh? he hit the back of my bike. I had a 550 XT. He hit the muffler on the top of his headlight and he spin me around on the road and I fell. When I stood up, because my bike was still idling, because it fell on the clutch. So the bike was still idling. And so when I stand up to go and switch off the bike, I just went back down because my leg was broken and the bone passed through the jeans pants I had, like, you know, that was my weight. And I had to sit down right there and I had to see the bike then. And deal. So Willy, that was my key. And I took a fall up by Digicel there, coming out from by the um, marina. I took a fall and I bruised my whole side of my leg and I just decided, you see that done? My days are over for that and I just stopped that deal. Nobody gets up telling yourself, I'm going to get hurt today, or I'm going to hurt myself today. You try to do things without being hurt. Being hurt is one of the least things on your mind. That's the perspective of the public, that people saying that's dangerous. You yourself, you don't see it. You don't see the dangers in it for yourself. That's how I could put it for me. That's just my perspective. I was coming from Viewfort with the 600. And I remember we were on the highway going up towards Northwest. And there was a 40-foot container truck on the left lane. And I was moving into the right lane to pass it. But there were two other vehicles in front of me. And never forget, a BMW sedan and a APV type van. So I didn't want to be on the side of this 40-foot container. So I waited behind and I watched the BMW go by. And I watched the APV going by. And I figured, okay, as the APV reaches the front of this, I'm just going to gun it and go through. So I gunned it. And while I'm on full throttle going past this 40-foot container, I just see smoke coming from the tires of the APV. Emergency braking. Because apparently the BMW decided at the last moment it wants to go into Northwest. So I had to apply all brakes. And that is coming off full throttle. I hit the brakes so hard the back lifted up in the air. And I'm just seeing, I'm coming towards this APV. And I'm just there thinking, wow, do I duck? <laughs> do I? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out in my mind, what's the best way to take this blow? So the bike luckily slowed down quite a bit before it went into the back of the APV. And then it fell towards the oncoming traffic. And I remember rolling on the ground, getting up immediately because I'm thinking, 
a car may be coming down this road to pick me up, jumping up immediately and running back before anything else. Um, I was lucky. I had on a, a long sleeve shirt, my helmet, gloves, jeans, shoes. So all I sustained was a scratch on my elbow from the fall. It wasn't a, a, a hard fall. It was more a roll on the ground. Well, the jeep made a U-turn across the highway and the bike was coming, he tried to maneuver around and then he hit him mid -ship. Take me back to 2016. It's a Sunday morning. You've left home. What happens next? See around my court area. I noticed a lot of traffic on the lane going up. So I was wondering, like, I just passed there a few minutes ago. What caused in the traffic now? So I was kind of looking ahead and this in you know in between lanes, middle line going up. And then I saw a white SUV stopped, almost stopped, and a big gap between that vehicle and the moving traffic. But I was wondering, like, I wonder why she, the person, kind of slowed down there and then just overtaking somebody crashing to me. Somebody doing a U-turn is crashing to me. What was happening? Just a couple bruises I get, cuts. Well, I broke my cheekbone, I broke my nose. Um, I like gash hair. And just other scripts. If I had a helmet, I would not, I don't even think I'll go into the hospital. If I had a helmet. Coming up, um, Old Mon Road, sport bike. Um, driver does not stop in the Latok Junction. I assume that she would. Um, hit her, went over the car, dragged a couple of yards, um, the gas station junction on the mon, um, above the speed limit, speed limit as usual. Uh, driver anticipated that he can make the turn into Cicero bus, didn't have enough time. I hit the side of the bus, went over, almost landed in the gas station. I've done the try to wheelie on my own and crash. Everybody falls. Motorcycling is very dangerous. The pros fall. Rossi falls. So at some point, you, me, everybody's going to fall. It's just a matter of time. You need to dress for the slide, not the ride. Everybody says you have to pay road tax. As an instructor, do you agree? Um, I may tend not to agree with the statement, but when you really look around, it looks like that's how you learn. <laughs> that's how you learn. It was my bike, but it's a friend of mine that was riding. I was at the back of it and the bike slide. That morning I went to fix something on the bike and on our way back, he was riding. And when we, this, there's this corner after by like it, the Mexico. And the bike slide off the road and I fell, roll and I pass out, knock out, you know, I was unconscious for a while, then revive and like, it's like I was in and out of consciousness. And then on the way to the hospital, like while the ambulance was going to the hospital, like, every time like he was driving fast, and every time he take a corner, I was feeling like something in my back, hurting. So then I was like, you know, I told them, the, the driver, you know, you don't have to drive so fast because it's not like I'm dying or anything like that. So then, while sliding down there, I 
touch my leg and I feel like I'm not feeling anything. Got to the hospital, did some x-rays and stuff like that and they told me that my spinal cord fracture. Yeah, and they tell me they're okay, well, I might not be able to walk and stuff like that. And you know, that really, I really took that hard. Well, to be honest, we were first. Um, neither of us had a helmet on. The road was dry. But I don't know, I... I like the corner, maybe we took the corner a little too fast, too fast. And maybe that's what that caused the uh, tire to slide on. Yes, fell on roll. How did life change for you? <laughs> well, everything changed. Everything. In just a minute, in just a second, everything changed. Nigel, how do you think this could have been avoided? I don't even know how to answer that question. Maybe just ride a little slower, especially around the corner. Make sure the tire is good, no ball tires. Because yeah, my tire was wasn't that good on the bike at the moment. So I guess that's what I guess that's what that cause it to slide and again you just speed well. And it, it's something that I thought of years before. But I was like, nah man, that's too dangerous. You can't walk on a bike. But then I say to myself, if that's what makes you happy, if that's what will make you feel better, then just do it. Be careful and just do it. I had a car, I sold a car, and I got a bike. For 138 years, we've had your back. From home contents to medical, auto to business continuity. GTM Insurance. Sound, solid and reliable. The Easy Cruises Riding Club was formed um, when uh, a group of cruiser riders um, thought that um, there were not too many cruisers and um, we decided to form a cruisers club because most of the other clubs were street bikes and um, off-road bikes etc and um, fast paced so to speak and so the cruisers that were there at the time and still are um, were from mature persons, persons of, of, um, of age, you know, and um, had that discipline that was different from the rest. When our club was formed, it is a riding club, but what we wanted to do, we wanted to not just make it a riding club, but we wanted to be more family oriented. We wanted, it, we wanted it to be uh, more into giving back to the community. And so our club really, while it's a riding club, but we do a lot of charity work. Um, members of our club, your family is also a member of the club. Um, so, so when we have activities, you find that um, persons' wives and their girlfriends and their children also participating in the activity. 
our club is not just only about riding. We host children's parties. We, 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 we help in school projects um, um, for, for children. We, we donate. We do a lot of charity work. We, we give um, hampers to the needy. And when we do go about doing that, we don't um, give hampers to the established um, places because a uh, number of commercial places already have these people, you know. Uh, but what we do while we ride, we visit the communities and we can identify personally with those persons who are really in need and can really get from the, the agencies that, that give to them. Because when we do ride, we don't just like just rush to go down to Fifort and back. We, we, we go to the various communities. Um, our ride will take us, for example, you know, you go inside the valley, you know, or you go Chozelle and you, you do the entire uh, um, Chozelle um, community um, or, or Babuno. And so when you go through these little villages and these little communities, you can see and, and have a one-on-one -on -one and find out this little family background and, and we, we, we do reach out to them. Well, the MotorX Club was designed to, of course, bring awareness to motorcycling from a sporting side of things that we have motocross, uh, which started out in 91 thereabout, um, with a group of individuals, uh, namely Chris Kessel, um, Gary DeVoe, Richard DeVoe, um, Wayne Quintin, Derek um, Clark, Derek Mogul. And they came together and started riding what was back in the day, Pope site. Within our club, one must be a club member in order to receive a duty-free concession for a dirt bike which is only to be utilized on designated areas, for example, the track, um, off-road purposes in the sense of you're going into say Louvet or somewhere of that sort, where it is not considered a legal road. If one would have to sell that motorcycle, the duties must be paid. But in reality, many of these bikes end up on the road. The question is, why? Okay, in reality, yes, the, a lot of these bikes end up on the road because either one, they've paid the duty. Now, how do you know a bike has paid the duty or not is a big question. I think sometimes the motorcyclists don't respect themselves on the road in terms of the, the way they ride the road. They don't respect their life. And um, sometimes when I still see these, um, these bikes pass me, I'm like, oh my goodness, is he going to stop? Would he slow down at the junction? You know, why is he not wearing a helmet? Um, why is he um, swerving through traffic like that? You know, what if a pedestrian was crossing? What you find is um, different um, classes, I would say, of individuals ride different bikes. For example, a scooter, you would find the scooters more or less beginners who just get onto a scooter. Some of them, no registration. The bike itself has no registration. They have no license or, and so on. So you'd find these persons riding um, the, the scooters. Then you have the the scramblers or the dirt bikes and so on, you find again young aspiring riders riding this and um, they tend sometimes probably practice on the tracks of the road and they come to, they tend to come on the road with the same, the same, um, I would say idea and then feel that they can have stunts on the road and so on, which is, which is not in itself, um, it, which is in itself against the law, yes. What's running through your mind, safety-wise? You're at the back of your bones, back. Mm -hmm. He's moving and moving through traffic. You have all of the variables coming at you. Hmm. A lot of thoughts. Mainly, we're parents. We're both parents to a child, to children. Um, I'm literally talking to myself. I'm screaming at Chavon in my helmet. 
because I get punches too though. He gets punches, he gets pinched. In my back pinched. While he's riding. If she doesn't have a helmet, maybe she should have bitten me by now. <laughs> I can tell you that. And I'm thinking if we fall, we're dead. <laughs> if we clip a car, we are dead. And that's it. And I'm just hoping if we do die, we die on the spot. And I'm thinking of the speed and it's just, when we stop, I'm like, this is crazy. And I'm having a talk with Siobhan, Siobhan, do not ride this fast when we go again. Okay, okay, babe, okay, that's true. And it's like we never had the conversation when we go again. It's, I don't know it's the adrenaline for him. I understand that, but I'm not always behind the bike with Siobhan. So I think that when I am with you, at least just, Take it easy. Carol described that feeling. You know, the first time, as a mother, watch your son get on that bike. The first time, it was inspiring because he was really young and he had never gotten on a bike before. And he had just gotten on the bike and started to ride. And I, we never taught him a thing. Siobhan just put the bike together, started it, and Tyler got on the bike, and it was like, how did he learn that? Like, automatically? Yes. And he was going up and down, up, and it was getting late. We were on our work compound at the time. Mm -hmm. It's time to go, tell Tyler, get off the bike, let's go. So the first time, it was, it was inspiring. It's almost as if he was born to ride. That's how I see it. And he actually has a shirt that says Born to Ride. Before he started riding, Tyler would, any given opportunity, anything, everything was a bike. Mm -hmm. I think I have a picture also with him Rocks on a stone, on, on a big rock at the beach, saying that's his motorcycle, he was riding a bike. This year, for the first time, we have got a record number of reports, a record number of reports, and a record number of complaints. When you come down the road wheeling with no helmets, it looks good for you, but it gets posted. The police force looks like they're not enforcing the law. It looks embarrassing to them. You come here to enjoy yourself, especially the, um, those coming from away. We welcome you here. It's nice. Persons like bike. They like to see it. Okay? My kids, they love it. But you have to conduct yourselves on the road. There'll be, I know, watch bikes that are there. It's teasing especially when riding. But I know there are times that you go off where there's not members of the public and then you do your little display. That is fine. You alone will get hurt, okay? But when you have persons, especially last night, I got a report that persons were at Rodney Bay Street. We lean, three persons in line going down. It's nighttime, your lights in the air, pedestrians don't see you. Okay, that is dangerous. We would not like, I would not like to hear any complaints again. Independence is a season of biking. It has become a culture. Every single motorcycle that can work, that will start, or barely, or barely start, will come out during independence, licensed or illegal, with a rider, skilled or unskilled. Job better, 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 
Persons who don't ride in groups, they're there. I think that's chaotic. I think we have to revisit how we do the independence ride. Should we stop it entirely because um, a few persons um, are being negligent? I think the problem is to, to rectify those negligent persons. The independence ride in Venice is not a safety ride. Um, no one is trying to be safe or anything like that. I think that is the desire to market it as a safety ride. But again, you need that bind to what you're selling. And that bind does not exist. It can't truly be called a safety ride because it truly is not a safety ride. If persons cannot have a proper safety ride, there would be no sense for me to approve any ride on the road. Once you are not going to have a safety ride, once you are not displaying aspects of safe riding, there's, it makes no sense you go and find a, an area where you could do your stunts, which, where the public is not involved, where you are not meeting oncoming traffic, you are not meeting pedestrians, you do your own thing. This ride, unless persons could get personal commitment that we will do X, Y, and Z, yeah, the ride should not be approved. I agree with him totally. Him being banned in the ride will not stop people from riding. The guys who have legal bikes and who ride regardless, is, I don't think there's a law against riding around the island. It's very difficult to tell a guy how to ride his bike. You can press him for safety, you can press him for paperwork, insurance, and license, and all that. But at the end of the day, the responsibility of how he rides is left up to him. The difference between a helmet and not having a helmet is a $700 trip to the hospital or a $70,000 trip to the hospital. And people don't really realize that. And that burden is not yours. That burden is your loved ones. We now have to go and find that money because you never listened. There was a point in time where I'd barely use a helmet. If you'd say, if I had to give you for a month, I'd say the percentage was I wouldn't use a helmet maybe 25 days out of the month. Why not? Um, for me, it wasn't about people seeing me. It's more about I feel more free without the helmet. That's one of the first things. When you are your face out of the helmet, you feel more free. Imagine I have a sign under my price list on the tire shop. No helmet, no service. You understand? And Dale, if I tell you, I get the B name for that already. Real B name. Guys don't even want to come by me because I just put that sign up. No helmet. Just for their own safety, you know. Safety. I just... I lose a lot of customers in terms of motorcycle riders because of that sign. Siobhan, you're not wearing a helmet. I just go in Babono to come back. But it does not always have to be you. You're not always the cause of the accident. The biker is not always the cause of the accident. Yeah, I know that, but I'm coming back just now. It's true. And again, it all boils down to confidence. I figure, like she said, riding is like walking. Mind you, riding with a half helmet is, to me, just like riding without a helmet. I have scars on my face to show. I fell. I was within the area. We didn't go too far. I had my half helmet riding with the fellas, and I felt the first thing that hit the, hit the road was my face. My jaw was, all hair was bruised up, you know, and I told myself I would never ride with that helmet again. As time progressed and I've ridden with a helmet, riding without a helmet now, with all the wind noise, all the traffic honking, the loud music, the dogs barking, you hear everything while you ride, and that to me is more of a distraction than just being focused on that road ahead of you. Have the cops ever stopped you with not wearing a helmet? Yes. And what happened? I got a charge. 
I was, a ticket was given to me at that point. Were you allowed to ride away? Yes, I was. Do you think that it's the right thing? Um, I think so. And here's my rationale. You take the bike, you don't give me a ticket. You give me a ticket, you don't take the bike. That's my rationale. For the first time ever in St. Lucia, the Monopo Cooperative Credit Union offers loans to purchase the vehicle of your dreams, regardless of the age. We also provide full comprehensive insurance coverage for vehicles up to 15 years. Our interest rates start at 6.5% with only 10% deposit required. So feel free, dream, test drive, select. We're here to provide the finance and insurance to get you on the road regardless of the age. Monaco Cooperative Credit Union. Our people, our community, our credit union. Telephone 455-3370. Did you have any friends along the years who had motorcycle crashes and died? Which one really stands out to you? The one. We commence tonight's broadcast with news that St. Lucia has recorded its first road fatality for the year. 23-year-old Eldridge Louis, better known as Hazel Louis, died after a collision between the motorcycle he was riding and a motor vehicle. The accident occurred near Mega J's shortly after 8 o'clock this morning. When he died, this Saturday we went practicing wheeling. And from practicing wheeling to talking on this, this Sunday on the phone about what we're going to do next Saturday and to wake up the next morning and get my phone of a million messages. Oh, you're not waking up. He's still just in you know, a bad accident. And then when I wake up, just rush to the hospital and they tell me he's still dying. I was driving on the left. I just heard an impact on my Jeep and I just saw the fellow some, um, some assault on the wall there. He was overtaking it. Was there another vehicle on the other side? Yeah, because I was on my left side. So there was another vehicle on the other side? Right, yeah. Because and what happened there? There are the hippo of minibus on the, on the um, bus stop there. So he tried to fit himself after it passed um, the minibus. So what was his condition after he got hit? Well, I saw him lie down between the gutter there and he was taking a short breath. Yes, I have. Um... I've had a number of friends who've lost their lives on motorcycles. Um, Francis Girodi, um, alias Junior, alias Fat Boy, alias Schumacher. alias Schumacher, best driver in the world. Best rider in the world. Um, the day he passed, he was going on a ride and he actually called me and asked me if I was going to join them for the ride. And I told him, nah, man, I'm not going to join. And I, I know that when he rides, you know, the way he rides and so on. I was like, nah, I don't really want to take that sort of risk and so on. A little too crazy, a little too wild, a little too out of control. And, you know, I didn't want anything happening. And then it was later in the night, you know, we got the news, you know, and it was just, it was messed up, honestly. Hearing that Junior had actually passed away. And it was really actually sad hearing that he actually wore a helmet. <laughs> you know, the day he crashed, he actually wore a helmet. So, yeah. Some would say that bikers bring this upon themselves. Many of them do not follow the rules of the road. So in a car, you would not be overtaking with two lanes of traffic or going through the center lane. You broke that rule and as a result, found yourself in a crash. Right. Many times when riders fall, it is because they are not following the rules of the road. What's your take? <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree with that. 
they, they don't really have any but you don't follow the rules, you get into an accident, you just have to deal with the repercussions, I guess. When I conceptualized this documentary, it was meant to address road safety for bikers. But what I learned over a two-year period while putting this documentary together was that most motorcyclists are their worst enemies. Sounds awful, but it's absolutely true. As the revs rise and the front wheels go up, they know each time they get on that motorcycle and ride without due care and attention and safety gear, the possibility of not making it home is a grave reality. It is that reality which provides the adrenaline for them and the fear that fills the tear bags of their family members as they look over the casket wondering what could have been done differently. It is the same adrenaline that their colleagues all come to their funerals with, all decked out in black leathers and beautiful helmets to reminisce, to soak in the new parting, albeit the funeral. It is a big line for bikers to wear their blacks, exchange high-speed stories and burn rubber until the next biker falls. Sadly, the majority of bikers interviewed agreed that falling and dying for the thrill of biking is just part of the game. And this is truly bike life in St. Lucia. Peace.